Welcome to a special Transmissions Alt Mode. In this episode, we're joined by Jean-Nique Bonton, the composer of Transformers Rise of the Beast. We talk about his background, how he got into scoring films, and what to expect of the score for the new movie. All right, welcome to another special Transmissions podcast. We are thrilled to speak with Jean-Nique Bonton, the composer of the Transformers Rise of the Beast movie score. JB is a prolific composer and musician who has worked on film, TV, and video games. Now he's taking us back to the 90s with a musical score for the latest Transformers film. That's right. JB, welcome to Transmissions. Hey, so happy to be here. So happy to talk with you guys and uh, share a little bit about my story, background, and the music for Transformers Rise of the Beast. Awesome. Yeah, let's uh, let's jump right in. Uh, first, can you tell us uh, how you first got into music and what led you to composing? Sure thing. So uh, my mom was very much interested in hearing the organ in the house. So she took a little four-year-old me and pop plopped in front of the organ with a music teacher. I didn't really love the organ, but eventually they bought a piano and that became my best friend, especially during the arduous middle school years where I could pour my poor little heart uh, into my little compositions on the piano and it kind of stuck. So I ended up being in various bands in school, accompanying people. Uh, but it was never really meant to be a career because I saw so many people who were way talented, my teachers, other professionals. And you know what? They all lived at home with their mothers. And I was like, that's not the life that I want. Nothing wrong living with your mom. Nothing wrong. It's just that I could see that, you know, being a musician, even though it's your calling, it's a tough industry. It's a tough uh, vocation. Uh, So I was like, nah, not for me. I'm just going to keep playing a little bit. When I went to college, the plan was to be a lawyer. So I figured what I did undergrad didn't really matter because I'm going to take my LSAT and go to law school. So I decided to study music. So I did my undergrad in music. I took my LSAT. I realized I was not going to law school. So that (laughs) wasn't happening. I feel like my score. Uh, And I graduated from college with a newly minted music degree. And I had no idea how to monetize it. So like most enterprising 22-year-olds in the uh, mid-90s, I answered an ad in the paper for a computer programmer needed, no experience necessary. I was like, I like computers. I have no experience. This is great. We're talking to me. (laughs) So I decided to answer the call, show up, I get hired. And that launches a 15 year career in computer science. I started out in Silicon Alley in New York City doing e-commerce things. And then eventually that led me to Silicon Valley where I was a executive director for a software security company. When that company was bought by HP, I was trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. And slowly but surely, music started coming back. Just started playing the piano again, started playing in church. uh, And eventually I discovered this thing called GarageBand on my Mac. And I started playing around with just writing a couple of things because, you know, I had a music degree, so I knew how to write music. I just started playing around, writing some music, this and that. And a friend of mine said to me, that sounds like film music. A light bulb went off. There's music in film. There's music in video games. (laughs) You've got to be kidding me. And this is a real job that people do. Oh, I think I want to do that. And as I researched a little more, you know what? I want to do that. And I'm going to do that. Well, the hubris at the time uh, really sort of made me very, uh, let's say, encouraged me to continue on this path. Uh, so while I was still working, I did more research. I found out this was a real career. I started uh, interning at a school called Pyramind in San Francisco. I met some more people. And eventually I met a guy named Clint Bajakian, who was the head of game music for Sony PlayStation. Oh. Yeah. I mean, and it really was just a chance meeting. I was there basically putting chairs away and he was there and I just talked to him and he said, you know what? I told him my story, what I wanted to do. And he said, why don't you come have lunch with me uh, next week down on the PlayStation campus and we'll talk about it. So I sent him some music that I had been writing because at this point I had been taking a couple lessons and 
uh, classes at Berman School of Music Online. So I had a little bit of music to share. It wasn't very good and no one will ever hear it anyway now. <laughs> um, so I sent it to him and he was like, oh, he's like, uh, you know what? You have some interesting instincts. Let's have lunch. So we had lunch and I told him my whole story background, what I wanted to do. And he said, you know what? No one is going to hire you as a composer working in Silicon Valley. You're a Silicon Valley executive. We basically want people who do this, you know, and been trained in this. So you're going to have to go back to school because that is going to erase your past and become the new starting point. And the school you need to get into is USC because it's the number one film scoring program in the world. And we have hired a ton of composers that have gone through that program. So challenge came on. <laughs> I had no idea how to get into the number one film scoring program in the world. But in business, I did know one thing. You can never be a name on a piece of paper. Every job that I had in software, it was because someone called me and said, you know what? Come with me. I know who you are. We're doing this thing over here. We're going to create a position for you or we're going to put you in the starting ranks of the, the company or whatever it was. So people knew who I was, knew my experience and skill set, and then wanted me to come with them to build new things. And that was a great career. Led me all the way to a Silicon Valley startup. So I said, you know, the people at USC just have to know who I am. So I went down to USC. I met the then director. Uh, we chatted a little bit, told him what I wanted to do and my story. And I guess he was intrigued, but he had obviously heard this before. Uh, so he wasn't really impressed. So he gave me an assignment. Uh, the class at USC, they actually invite composers who are well established to come and do workshops with the students. So this, I guess, last week, a uh, composer named Teddy Shapiro, uh, who it, it actually became a wonderful mentor to me later on in my story, uh, was the mentor. And he gave everybody an assignment from the Devil Wears Prada. So he gave me the same assignment from the Devil's Wears Prada and said, you know what? Go home, score it, send it back to me, and then we'll talk. So I took, I was quaking in my boots uh, because this was kind of like the big interview I thought. Took it home, and I spent a few days working on this score for, you know, when Meryl Streep's character first comes into the building and everybody's hiding, preparing. So I did this uh, piece of music for that scene, and I sent it in to him. Uh, he wrote me back and said, you know, it's not bad, but it's also not good. <laughs> but the important thing is, you did it. And I can hear something of your voice in this music. So let's keep talking. He said, because I've given the same assignment or done similar things with people in your position who want to make a change, and I never heard from them again. You actually followed through and sent me the assignment. So I went back to USC. I met another professor there, uh, the late Jack Smalley, who taught there for many years and did uh, many, lots and lots of episodes of TV, such as things like Charlie's Angels back in the day. So I coerced him to be my private instructor. So I flew down from Silicon Valley to LA twice a week, sorry, not twice a week, twice a month to take private lessons with him. And at the end of that time with him, which was almost about nine months, I had a portfolio of things that I was actually proud of. So I submitted that as part of my application to USC. So that Plus them also knowing me because I continue to visit, continue to talk with people, share my story. I guess that's, I'd let me in the back door. Uh, <laughs> so I was there in 2011, 2012. And from there, slowly but surely built a career. Uh, and am at where I am today because of that guy, Clint Bajakian said, I got to go to USC, erase my past and start over. Which of course wasn't easy because at that point I had acquired a wife and two kids. And it was a journey from, you know, being rich dad to now being student dad. Uh, but along the journey, we had everything that we needed. No one was ever hungry or we had a roof over their heads. Uh, and my boys, you know, they're big, so they were eating a lot, but they were never hungry. Uh, clothes were fine. So every day we had what we needed on this journey. Uh, and I could just slowly but surely see that this is what I was meant to do. 
It's great that you have that support also from the home. Oh, yes. Because, you know, my wife said, I didn't marry you for this. You know, we were in this in a different kind of situation, but she saw the passion in my heart. Uh, She saw that this was something that was very important to me. And she had faith and said, you know what, we're going to go on this journey together. That's awesome. Yeah. And I I saw recently that you're so after you you went to USC, you're now you're now teaching there. Is that correct? Mm. I did teach at USC. So a few years after I graduated, they hired me back to be the technology teacher. So it was kind of interesting, you know, just getting out because I was the tech guy in every USC class. There's a person that does something. So I was the tech person. We had people that were the conductors, people that were the orchestrators, people that were the action, people that were the video game. And I was the tech person. So when there was a vacancy for the tech instructor, you know, I applied because, again, with my newly minted USC degree, no studio was sitting here waiting for me to hire me. I was like, Clint, I thought I was getting ready to get hired by Sony. No, Clint was in the wind. I didn't hear from Clint. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) Clint and I stayed connected over the years. But, you know, uh, that was just the first step. So I had to figure out a way to keep the lights on and keep a roof over my family's head. And that ended up being uh, teaching, for one. So I taught at USC and at Occidental College. But I also started a tech company doing tech support for other composers. Uh Remember that guy, Teddy Shapiro? He was my first client. And bless his heart, because I knew a little bit having a tech background, but obviously I was learning and he was very patient with me uh, as we worked through the kinks of the systems that I was setting up for him. But I learned a lot. Then he recommended me to Alexander Desplat, a wonderful French composer who's done many, many, many things and who was a real sort of uh, hero of mine and inspiration for me. So to be able to work for him uh, for a few years was amazing. And then it slowly but surely grew. I started working then for Alan Silvestri, uh, uh, um, Michael Giacchino was a client, uh, Danny Elfman, the late Johan Johansson, Dustin O'Halloran. So uh, the list just went on and on. I had about 120 clients around the world. And it was composer tech that basically kept the lights on while I continued to work on the short films, uh, the small films, the web series, whatever came my way from the filmmakers that I met when I was at USC. And I continued to build those relationships with them. And because I had, you know, money from another income, I was able to reinvest what little money they could give me back into the project. So I, my production skills for doing film scoring also grew because I was able to take that, even if it was 300 bucks, I could then hire someone to do record at my house and uh, make the score even that much better. So that was the hall. And eventually, as my uh, filmmaker collaborators grew in their career, they brought me on. And I can tell you that almost every major breakthrough in my career, in my journey, came from a relationship from USC or a relationship from the Sundance uh, program, the Sundance Composers program, uh, which really have both blessed me so much in my life. That's awesome. So we're we're going to get into into movies and film, but I do want to ask about video games just because that's that's something that I, that I've loved since I was a kid. So how did how did you get into uh, like how what was your first big break with video game uh, scoring or is there is there can you give us some some examples of things you've worked on in the past? I know recently Redfall just that's came right. out. Redfall and just you, came and out. you're working on that. You uh, you produced that. So I produced the entire score for Redfall and I'm really oh. excited and ex- about that. Uh, I think it's an interesting sound. And I think people are writing about the score, you know, so that's actually exciting that people are feeling that the score is working with the game and sets the appropriate mood. Uh, someone today just hit me on Instagram saying, hey, did you guys release the album or the soundtrack for the score? Because it's so great. And uh, thank God we did. So you can actually <laughs> listen to the Redfall score. Uh, on all streaming platforms, which I am very, very proud of. But I was an avid gamer ever since a kid. Uh, I, my first computer was like an Apple II GS. Uh, I know I'm dating myself right now. You know, I had, 
Oh, <laughs> Apple TV. I remember yeah. that one. That's right. Was it Oregon Trail, like one of the first games? Yeah, on yes. That? That's right. Yes. Yeah. I that game. Oh, my goodness. What you could do with some ASCII characters, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Back then. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I grew up with the computers and I grew up with video games. I had a, a VIC-20 was actually my first. No, sorry. It was a VIC-20 and a Commodore 64. And then I was able to coerce my dad into getting me an Apple II GS right before uh, in high school. Uh, uh, had the, you know, Nintendo, everything. So I basically always had some sort of gaming system. I was the kid that you would get dropped off. Mom would drop off at the mall, <laughs> give you a roll full of quarters, and she knew I was still going to be in the arcade uh, when she came back, right? So that was me. Or the arcade was my daycare. So, <laughs> sorry, Mom. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Uh, so video games were always a big part of my life, but I never really noticed the music and video games. So when this epiphany happened that there's music and video games, I said, you know what? I want to do video games first. So the first um, foray into this or approach to this was to do uh, video game scores. And that's, again, I went to a school in Paramide. It was mostly focused with San Francisco. So obviously a big tech corridor. That's how I met Clint Bajaki and PlayStation. So that was my focus. I wanted to do video games. But Clint or someone else told me early on, even before I went to USC, that there's not a great crossover from video games composers to film or TV composers. And this, this was this way like 12 years ago. Um, and that when people start in movies, right, they might be asked to do a video game. Uh, perfect example was Harry Rickson Williams, who did Metal Gear Solid. You know, he had a huge movie career, but then he wrote one of the most evocative, one of my favorite scores uh, for a video game for Metal Gear Solid. So I was like, you know, I need to emulate that career. So even though video games were really the impetus for all of this, I waited a little bit because I said, I got to grow up in the film world. But uh, I met a young man named, um, oh, geez, now I'm, why am I forgetting, blanking on his name right now? Uh, Oh my goodness. And he's going to kill me if you actually watch this movie. <laughs> he's really, really, really going to kill me. Uh, he did the score for Call of Duty World War II, um, and which won many, many, many awards. And he asked me to join him to do some additional music. So this was my first foray you know, into doing game music was this AAA title, which I couldn't believe. But we had met in San Francisco. Uh, we had become friends, and he's going to kill me because I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> still on a blank. Um, and we ended up working together on that. And let me tell you, he kicked my butt because he was a he is a wonderfully talented composer, and I was a mid composer. So he really sort of told me what I needed to do to get to the level so that it could actually make it into the game. And you know, under his tut tutelage. Uh, I was actually able to write some music that ended up in some of the biggest, bigger sequences of the game because he, you know, he gave me all the action music. Uh, maybe that's why I'm forgetting his name's the trauma. Gilbert uh, <laughs> Roger. Yeah. Wilbert Roger. That's correct. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. Google to the rescue. Yeah. Thank you, man. Jeremy, you saved me. <laughs> Wilbert, don't hold this against me. Uh, Wilbert Roger. Uh, we had a very similar background to the same undergrad, all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, he really gave me my first opportunity and allowed me to understand what level the music had to be at for it to be at the professional level like that. And then after that, again, Wilbert to the rescue uh, recommended me for Redfall. He was friends with the uh, audio director, uh, Ben Crossbones. They'd worked together in the past. So when Ben was like, hey, we're looking for someone to do a spooky hip hop score. Who do you know? Wilbert recommended me. And I demoed for the game. It wasn't just given to me. I demoed for the game, worked really hard on that demo. And eventually they hired me uh, to be the composer for the game. So awesome. I'm really excited that, you know, my two sort of game experiences were on AAA titles. How lucky is that? Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. We uh, we read a quote from you uh, that says, uh, film music has to tell a story without words. So can you can you talk about that in the process of scoring a movie and how you sure. do that? Sure. So I mean, first the role, you know, of film music is to I want to say confirm what the audience should be feeling. You don't want film music to be ahead of the action or the dialogue or anything like that. 
You want it to confirm that something important has happened, confirm that there's an emotional shift. So you're always sort of there to give that emotional support or underpinning to whatever scene is. It be an action sequence where you're really trying to help the adrenaline go, or you're trying to work on the threat uh, that the audience should be feeling, or it could be an emotional cue where you know you want to confirm that the character is really emoting here and has some sort of sense of loss. So you know, I'm always there to sort of confirm what is there. So first and foremost. Film music has a function, which is to be emotional, right? And to carry the wide span of emotions. So being able to, I think, craft a piece of music that has emotion in it, but also tells a story and shifts. Because obviously, when you're watching a movie, you're not looking at a static picture. Things are changing, things are moving. And even in, the, in one dialogue or in one scene with dialogue, there could be a major shift in what happens. So the music, you know, I think film music has to be able to support that story and have the appropriate shifts, but at the same time, not call attention to itself. Because people are there for the actors, the dialogue, right? The music is there to give support, but not to be the focus. Sometimes it is. And we look for those moments when there's the montage. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, you just take a song in there, not <laughs> giving us the opportunity <laughs> to, like, you know, do the score. So, you know, uh, the other thing that I realized is that, you know, growing up in New York and enjoying, you know, hip hop, R&B, you know, gospel uh, and really being rooted in the African-American traditions of music, um, especially growing up, you know, with rap music. Uh, With rap music, you know, you actually could have like, you know, a four bar phrase or at least something that repeats and it kind of goes on. And the lyrics is what gives you the cadence, the energy or potentially the storytelling aspect of it. So when you don't have lyrics, right, music can just then just feel repetitive if it's in that same sort of structure. So one of the things I wanted to craft early on is how can I take these uh let's just say these uh, genres of music, hip hop, R&B, gospel, that usually rely on lyrics, make them instrumentals, still be in that same world, but tell a story, right? And have the appropriate shifts. And, you know, one of the things that people always tell me when they peruse, you know, my music on my website is that listening to your music, it creates a story. In my, I don't know what kind of story it's creating, but it creates some sort of story in their mind and they can sort of hear that there's a journey. The music takes people on a journey. And I, that's what the, the important thing for film music. It's not static. It comments on what's happening and it needs to be able to take you on that journey, support that journey without calling attention to itself. Very cool. So w- when you're working on a movie, um, what's in, in what's the process with the director? Like, does the director map out scenes for you and say, you know, here's the here's what I'm going for here, or you get like like a, maybe a cut of the film and you just watch it, you know, start to finish right. and say, oh, I, how how do I map out what goes here, here, here? Well, it kind of depends on what your relationship is with the director and the film and when you come on. So, for example, if I'm coming on really early, they're still in script stage or it's an idea. I might be asked to write music away from picture that has a certain uh, feel to it, that evokes certain emotions that the director wants the audience to eventually feel when the movie is done. So that or it might help them write, get them into the right mood for writing. So it could be early on where I'm writing music away from picture that just does that sort of storytelling and creates those textures that emote what the uh, writer, director, producer wants to feel. But more typically, you're brought in when there's at least a director's cut, you know, or maybe there's some sort of producer's cut, but there's some cut of the film. And, you know, as they are editing the film, they're putting in things like temp music into the film. So this way, they're choosing from all the best scores in the world, right, little pieces of pieces of music, cues of music to give, again, support the scene in the way that they need it to be supported. And sometimes it's the editor, you know, the film editor grabbing pieces of music that they're familiar with. They know they already have a treasure trove of things that they know, their toolkit, and they're putting it in, right, as they're cutting the scene together. And in more... Uh, let's just say in bigger productions, 
uh, you might have a music editor that does that. So there's a separate person called a music editor that would then be editing together the temp score. And that's where things can sort of really uh, be challenging because they know how to edit music and it sounds like a real score and it's doing all the storytelling and it's crafted to the scene. And sometimes you watch it like, how am I ever going to beat that? This is perfect, <laughs> right? And they're also pulling from, you know, the best pieces of music in the film music canon. So you're like, wow, what am I going to do to like top this? So, you know, at that point, when they have the director's cut, it's got a temp either by the editor or a music editor. Then you will do a spotting session with the director. And that means you sit and watch the movie. Hopefully I get a cut of the movie before. So I come with some ideas and then we watch it together and we talk about, you know, what is the role of music? And one question I love to ask, you know, directors is if music were a character in the film, what would its purpose be? Because everything in a film has a purpose. Even the picture that's hanging behind the actor, right? When they're doing their speech or whatever, that picture was placed there for a purpose. So my question is, what is the purpose of music in this film? And then with that question or lens, we look at all the scenes that have music and we ask, well, what's the purpose for the music in the scene? And that then gives me, you know, a sense. I also listen to the temp and I get a sense of what is the pacing that they're looking for? Uh, what is the instrumentation that they like, right? Is there anything that's different or quirky about the score, the style of the score that they've chosen? So I listen to all of those things to get a sense of, okay, this is what they would like. And then hopefully they chose me because they heard something in me that uh, works for them or emotes something in them. So, you know, then I take all that information and I try and write some music. Sometimes I write it away from pictures. So I would do basically what I call a suite, which just allows me to write a piece of music that uh, pulls together all the ideas that I have for what the score should be. And then I play it for uh, the director or the producers. And I said, you know, do you hear your movie in the score? Does the score, you know, do the thing or this, sorry, this uh, uh, suite, as we call it, does the suite do the thing that you want the music to do? Does it fulfill that purpose that we talked about? And if they say yes, that's great. But they never really say yes, 100%. They say, I like this piece over here. I like that over there. This piece I don't like. What is that instrument? It bug, bugs me. So, you know, it's a conversation that you then have. And it allows you then to find the sound and the soul of the score. So as you sort of, you know, work on that suite, you know, away from picture, then I like to start applying things to picture from those suites. So I might see a scene. Okay, I know that uh, this piece of music that I wrote, you know, the, the Dark Warrior Suite. Uh, I want to try that over here. So then I throw it up against picture. Uh, first time I watch it, I usually hate it. It's like, I don't understand why this, who wrote this thing. Uh, so, but then after a while, I kind of get used to it, right? Or I try a different piece of music and I find something that kind of works. And then I start to craft that piece of music to the scene uh, to see if I can make it work that way. And then we start, show that to the director. The director usually says that they hate it. Uh, <laughs> not really. Uh, sometimes they say they love it. Sometimes they hate it. And you just got to have that conversation about, well, what, how do we change it? Because once you have something, right, you can talk about that something. It's when things are sort of amorphous and ethereal, that's when they become sort of, I don't know what we're saying. But as soon as you can point to a piece of music and say, okay, here it is to the picture. How does it make you feel? They can definitely say it works. It doesn't work. I like this. I don't like that. It's too slow here. It's too fast here. It's too loud, blah, blah. So now we start to create sort of a sensibility and a vernacular, you know, for the film score, which is very important because we're on the same, using the same terms, the same language. We're building a language, not only between each other, but also for the film. And then we do that a bunch of times until we get that right. And then at a certain point, there'll be a themes. There'll be musical melodies or potentially sounds or motifs, which are just sort of short phrases of music uh, that might start to gravitate or work towards certain characters, right? So I might have a theme for this person, a theme for that person, a theme for the place, right, uh, that they're in, or a theme for one of the montages. So then I can start taking those building blocks, right, and seeing where I can apply those building blocks, those ideas throughout the, the film so that the film score has some sense of cohesion and that it doesn't seem like random pieces of music, but it actually feels like one thought, one idea, and it fits the tone and the emotions and the journey of the film. Oh, 
Sorry, I, I know my answers are long winded, but I was a teacher, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's great. <laughs> um, I, I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure if this is in your purview or or if there's a like if there's an extra step. But how do you um, how do you uh, do combine the score and the original music with music that's like sampled or soundtrack? Like you know, you right. mentioned hip hop as a big influence, and of course, hip hop is a is you know the basis of hip hop is a lot of sampling. So. Yep. How do you um, do you are you in charge of putting that in into oh, no. the movie as well? Oh, no, 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 okay. no, 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 no. Okay, <laughs> that's a, that's a very sort of uh, interesting and complicated process because you know there's usually the director or producer or editor that you know think about the songs in the film. Sometimes the songs are written into the script, so they already know that this montage, this background music, this whatever is going to be this song, and that the whole scene revolves around them talking about that song. So they have to have that song. So a lot of those song decisions are made, you know, outside of my purview because I have enough to worry about creating something that's you know unique and different and uh, for the for the score. But the director producer would usually hire someone called a music supervisor. And they give a music supervisor a budget and say, okay, and a list of songs that they like. And then the music supervisor says, well, you can only afford one of these songs and everything else we're going to have to go and figure out creative ideas on how to make. So, you know, then that's what the music supervisor's uh, goal is, is, or job is to, you know, use his budget and acquire the rights, you know, to sync these songs, basically get sync licenses for these songs. and. If they can't get a particular song, can they find something that is similar to that song, right? But maybe it's an unknown artist or an up and coming artist, you know? So they try and figure out, you know, ways to solve this problem or this opportunity, this opportunity with the budget that they have, (laughs) right? Uh, And that, then they have to negotiate with publishing companies. In hip hop, it's really complicated because as you said, it's based on samples, right? Yeah. So they not only have to clear the uh, hip hop song, they have to go clear the sample or the samples, you know, that were that made up that song. So it's a very complicated, you know, job, honestly. And I don't want anything to do with it. Maybe if I was going to law school, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'd be okay because be contracts. But whatever. maybe in yeah. an alternate universe, that was your career. Maybe yes. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 no. So you know, a lot of times when I'm working on the score, they obviously would have put their uh, let's just say the songs that they wanted might not be the songs that end up in the movie for all things we talked about, but the songs that they wanted are usually in the movie and their score potentially going into it or out of it. Um, okay. So one thing that I've got to think about is I have to think about, you know, how can the score hand off to a song and then how can the song hand off to the score? So I'm thinking about key. I'm thinking about texture Right. Because I don't want it to be a train wreck uh, when you sort of go to the song from the score or vice versa. So I'm always figuring out how I can sort of lead the audience into and out of, you know, the song that they paid a million dollars for. Right. Now, you you mentioned, uh, you know, the, this process. So let's let's talk about in particular with Rise of the Beast. So you're working mm-hmm. with Stephen Capel, Jr., Right. Uh, but you've worked you've worked with him in the past on several projects, previous projects. So how did you two start collaborating? Well, remember that place, USC, that I talked about earlier? <laughs> he and I met at USC. Okay. And, you know, one of the things that I didn't realize uh, when I was applying is that there's actually a world class film school, the School of Cinematic Arts, right across from the music school. And they encourage collaboration. So Stephen Cable Jr. on his first short film. Uh, at USC, he hired me to score it. And uh, we've been together working on things ever since. From our uh, web series called Class to a our first feature called The Land that went to Sundance and did well and got distributed through IFC Pictures. Um, then eventually I came on as additional music to work with him on Creed 2. You know, Ludwig Gorenson obviously did an amazing job on the Creed score and they hired him to do Creed 2. But Stephen was directing and he made the request that I come on board and work under Ludwig, which was an amazing experience, actually. And I learned so much uh, working under such a talent. So that was a, a yet another blessing. And then eventually uh, it came to Transformers Rise of the Beast. And, you know, when I heard that he had gotten it, I was like, oh, well, they'll never hire me. Maybe pick me up on the on the next go round. Right. Because 
uh, I'm not worthy. You know, I don't have a blockbuster feature, you know, under my belt. So they would never really hire me. But to the strength of, you know, my agents and the strength of Stephen pulling for me, uh, they ended up hiring me and they hired me early because rightly so. I had never done this before. I mean, who really, I think two people have done Transformers movies. So I mean, there's not a big pool of people to pull from uh, to do Transformers movies. So they hired me really early. And, you know, Lorenzo de Bonaventura, one of the producers said, uh, I would like to hear music in the movie to picture as soon as possible. Because he wanted to know uh, what we were thinking about, what we were producing, and to his credit, he said, because not because I want to fire you, but because I want to be able to direct you early enough in the process and give feedback early enough in the process. So this way you can be successful. So that was great. So, you know, when we had the first sort of screening of the movie, uh, you know, uh, early in the process, I had already written the cold open and, you know, the first reel of music. So or the first. So I was working with the songs. I created some themes. I put all that stuff together uh, so that this way they could get a sense of what my sensibility was and how I would approach scoring uh, Rise of the Beast. And they liked what they heard. So I got another few months to do some more stuff. And slowly but surely, (laughs) I just kept thinking I was getting extensions. Uh, And slowly but surely, you know, after working on being hired, I guess it's been a year and a half, being on the project for about a year and a half. You know, we have a score that we're very proud of and excited for the world to hear. Awesome. Now, are you a fan of Transformers? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I grew up with Transformers. As a kid, you know, showing up in the 80s, like the Transformers were, you know, near and dear to my heart. I had one of the first Optimus Primes, you know, uh, Starscream. Uh, I had a Bumblebee. I had all the, you know, I, I think if we had to max it at three, my, my mom wouldn't maybe buy any more after that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and I remember my brother broke my Starscream once and I was very upset about that. But anyway, so the whole of the stories. So I had the toys. You know, I grew up with the animated series. I grew up with then the movie, uh, you know, oh my goodness, you know, you've got the touch, right? I mean, give me a break. I love <laughs> <the> <laughs> You know, Rodimus Prime, the whole nine. So, I mean, I've been a Transformers fan since the beginning, right? And then when the movies came out and that first shot in the alley when Optimus Prime actually transforms and you see all of the intricacy of the the moving parts and everything, dude, I was done. At that point, I was actually like a a young man. So I was still part of (laughs) Transformers lore, getting excited about Transformers, uh, even until now. And when, you know... I heard that I got the job, I actually cried. I really cried because, well, I cried out of fear for one, but I also, <laughs> was the shoes I was stepping into, but I also cried because I felt that this is like the culmination of a journey, not the end, but at least saying that something that was near and dear to my heart, I get to be part of that next chapter. And I was extremely humbled and moved by that op- this opportunity. Awesome. Now, I, I mean, I know it, you know for for us since we're since we do a podcast about Transformers, we're kind of deep deep in it for a long time. But I but I have to imagine you kind of maybe dipped out of it after childhood and then kind of came back a little bit later. So that is very uh, true. I was not a fan. I was not part of the Beast Wars era. OK, OK, <laughs> so that, that is not part of my era with Transformers because I did dip out. I was there in the beginning and early, but, you know, I had to come back and understand, you know, who uh, the Maximals are uh, and you know, sort of what their role in their story is. So now I have become a fan of it. But at this point, you know, I did do the dip out and came back. Oh, it's, 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 it, you know, it's very welcoming. So welcome back. <laughs> glad, glad we got you back. <laughs> I'm so now, happy to be here. <laughs> now, with uh, I mean, we've we've seen from the trailers that Rise of the Beast is set in the '90s, and and definitely we hear that that hip hop soundtrack. I mean, I I think I heard Biggie Smalls, I heard yep, DMX in the DMX, trailer. That's correct, all that. Um, so can I mean, without spoiling anything, can you can you tell us a little bit about like some of the themes that you were targeting with this score, or, or yeah. you know, 
No problem whatsoever. Um, so, you know, what there, I think there are three kind of distinct sounds to the score. Um, you know, as you know, it's 90s, it's Brooklyn. So we had to introduce the sound of 90s in Brooklyn, you know, into the score. Um, now, it is not a hip hop score. This is a transformer score. So it will be big. It's epic. It's orchestral, right? Uh, it's hybrid, meaning it also has synths. But you'll find that it also has a little bit of bounce and a little bit of groove to it. And the iconic sound of, you know, the instrument of, you know, 80s and 90s hip hop, the Roland 808 drum machine. So definitely had to get the 808 involved in the score, uh, in the appropriate parts. And then I also say, give it that Brooklyn bounce, you know, uh, through some syncopated rhythms and sort of the way that things kind of move rhythmically as well as harmonically. So I tried to infuse, you know, me growing up as a 90s uh, kid with hip hop into the score. But yet it is not a hip hop score. So you'll get tastes of it that's sort of flavored by the environment. And I'm very excited. I think we really sort of pulled it off. Some interesting stuff from Mirage as well. And you'll hear in the score, uh, we really sort of went into an interesting direction, I think, for, you know, his theme and some of the sounds that are associated with him. Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited for people to hear it. Awesome. Yeah. A couple of years ago, we, we talked with Alexander Bornstein, who did, who's the composer for the Netflix War for Cybertron show. That's right. And he talked about how the music kind of set the mood and scene for Cybertron, it was like very dark. And uh, with this movie, you have Peru, New York City, and some giant planet eater <laughs> that we've seen in some trailers. And, you know, can you talk about like creating kind of the music for each yeah, location each section. and then how they all work together? Okay, so I didn't spoil that for anybody, but it's okay. I didn't say it. I the trailers, say it. the trailers, the trailers told us. The trailer already. told you. Okay, fair enough. The trailer did tell you that. That's right. You saw Machu Picchu. You saw all that stuff. So you knew where you yeah. were. Okay, good. So I'm not ruining. Uh, so we talk about the first part when we're in Brooklyn. You know the influences that we bring in from Brooklyn. Uh, so we just mentioned that, right? When we go to Peru, uh, I was very important to me to integrate the sound of uh, that region of Peru. Uh, Machu Picchu and Cusco. So what I did some research and I called a friend of mine who also went to USC, uh, who was a composer that came to the program and then went back to Peru, born and raised in Peru, went back there. So I called him and said, hey, what are some of the instruments, the rhythms uh, that I need to be aware of so we can integrate them into the score and give the score that feeling? So he gave me a huge like, you know, uh, document with links and all that stuff. So I got a chance to do a deep dive you know, into the music of that area. And the music that um, spoke to me most was the Afro-Peruvian uh, style of music. Uh, that's very syncopated, very rhythmic, you know, sometimes goes in 6-8. So those are all very interesting rhythms and patterns for me. So when I started to talk about uh, the need to, you know, bring in some musicians to sort of help really help me nail the sound, one guy's name showed up, Alex Acuna, uh, here, the world-class percussionist. He's here in L.A. and he joined, you know, the music team to really help us nail, you know, the Afro-Peruvian rhythms that are baked into the score uh, for that section of the movie. Uh, he brought his troop in. We spent a day at Warner Brothers and we recorded, you know, tons and tons of uh, Latin percussion, and specifically uh, instruments that are from that region, which were very special. So that's what you're going to hear as part of that score. Then I worked with uh, another gentleman uh, named uh, Pedro Eustache. And Pedro Eustache is an amazing uh, woodwind player who works with people like Hans Zimmer and goes on the Hans Zimmer Live Tour and all this stuff. So he's kind of famous in our community. Uh, and we asked him to come on board, and he jumped in, and he brought in you know, flute specifically from the region and never heard before. He built a Tarka type flute uh, so that we could play some of the melodies because uh, with what we were trying to play as far as the notes, they weren't naturally accessible on the native instruments. So he created a custom flute with a Tarka mouthpiece that gave us the texture that we needed, but also be able to hit all the notes that we needed. So that was pretty exciting. And then we also brought in. Uh, the famous bass player, uh, Abraham Laboreal, uh, who basically came out of retirement to come and play on the score. 
and he brought, you know, the guitar on fire uh, for this section. So, you know, it wasn't only a concentrated effort on wanting to represent and be authentic to the region. It was about then finding the people that could really bring that flavor. And I think you will definitely hear that there. And then finally, for the more Cybertonian uh, 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 area that you saw that looks sort of more metallic, you'll we'll rely way more on synths uh, for that section uh, as being sort of a synthetic world, right? Or a synthetic landscape. So we rely way more on synths. And I've got uh, great friends who came on and helped me with uh, finding some really rare stuff. Uh, Nathan Matthew David and um, oh, geez, Anthony Baldino. Uh, two amazing synth programs have amazing synth collections, and we were able to get some very rare sounds uh, on the score, accompanied with the themes and that we created and the melodies that we created. So you kind of get three distinct sounds of the score as, again, we get music telling a story as our characters navigate these environments and landscapes. Is, is it much of a challenge to kind of blend them as you're transitioning from one location to another? Well, you know, here's the thing. Um, one of the things that I love to do and many film composers love to do is you create a melody, right? And the melody, as I was told, and I uh, understand, is the subject, right? The melody is sort of like what you want to say. And people can hear that melody and they attach it to either a character or a place, right? Or a group of people, whatever it is. And you sort of are very specific about that melody when this thing or this person or whatever happens. So you start to attach, okay, this this is the melody for these people. But then you create the context, right? The harmony, the texture, the instrumentation, all of that can change, right? To give you the context of what this character is in. But yet it's still recognizable because we've trained you on the melodies. So when we move from each of these environments, the themes that we create are all consistent. The themes for our villains, the themes for our, uh, you know, uh, various heroes, the theme for, you know, the search, we create all these themes. So when we move from Brooklyn, they have that Brooklyn bounce. Then we move to Peru, they're surrounded with more of a Peruvian percussion and Peruvian grooves. Then we move to, you know, the last environment, right? They're more surrounded by synths. So this way you're going on these, these melodies, right? These themes are going on a journey with our characters. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, and, and speaking of collaboration, we did see uh, on your Instagram and and on uh, a tweet by previous Transformers movie composer Steve Jablonski uh, that uh, he's on a part, he's a part of your team and was a mentor for you. That is uh, absolutely on this right. film, and I was super um, not only geeked out to like meet him, and uh, when he agreed to come on board and sort of you know uh, be a mentor for me, uh, I was extremely. You know, blowing my mind like again this was the guy who created you know the themes that not only that i love and know but so many people around the world you know love and know and and you know when i was uh announced that i was part of this people were writing me about how much those themes meant to them so you know and how it brought them through you know dark times or encouraged them to do the thing that they needed to do so i know that these things meant a lot so i met steve it was a wonderful conversation and he agreed to come on board and mentor. So, you know, I would run pieces of music by him. Uh, and he would give me his thoughts, you know, about this or that. Uh, then, you know, we had this great idea that toward the end of the movie that we would actually, you know, create a medley of the past themes, right, of the movie, of the movie franchise, plus the new themes that we're introducing uh, in the movie as well. And to create a medley, you know, to sum up, because, you know, no spoiler here, you know, Prime always gives an epic speech, right? At the end, Autobots, and da, 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 we vanquished, right? So he always does that. So, you know, during that sequence, um, uh, uh, we end up playing a medley, right, of all these themes. And I asked Steve to actually write that. And he did an amazing job of putting that together. And I think it's going to be a great thing for the fans to hear, you know, the themes that mean so much to them, right? Along with, you know, the new sort of stuff that we've been creating that they went on this journey uh, on this movie. Very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, th those um, soundtracks or those, the Michael Bay movies that he, he worked on, in, in a lot of cases, they were the best parts of the movies. <laughs> 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 I can't tell you how many times I've just like, 
needed to focus and I just throw on, you know, one of those albums. Oh yeah. They're amazing. And I mean, again, the themes are just so, you know, evocative. Boom, 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 right? It's like you already know where you are and they set the mood and the tone and they have so many feelings, right, attached to them. So, uh, you know, I was really honored to be able to, you know, work with him on these themes. And I learned a lot just by studying them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you uh, you ever uh, run across Vince DiCola? In your career ever? No, Vince Nicola, no. Don't know that person. He, he did the score on the 86 movie. Oh, like I did not run into him, but I should know his work because uh, we actually listened to the 86, we watched the 86 movie, listened to the score, and all I want to say is there's, you know, there's a bit of an Easter egg, musical Easter egg to that movie. So <laughs> hopefully uh, the fans will catch it and they'll say, Yes. Cool. Oh, we're, we'll be we'll be listening for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, hopefully you hear it. Yeah, uh, a lot of us have listened to that probably more than any other album. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great. It's great. It's just uh, so much of the '80s and you know mm-hmm. synth sounds at the time and the roots of the time. It's really cool. So we wanted to you know get a little piece of that and you know put that in our score. Awesome. Now, um, earlier you mentioned uh, that you had uh, in the past had uh, had had worked with uh, Michael Giacchino, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I noticed that uh, just last year he, or maybe it was the year before, he he actually got to direct a, a short or a, 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 right. a show for Marvel, the Werewolf by Night, mm-hmm. uh, which you know I, for me it was it was surprising to see someone who go who's primarily known for musical scoring getting into directing. So I guess I wanted to ask you. Is that an ambition of yours? Any any interest in, in getting into well, actually directing? Interesting. I think I would start by producing first, if anything. Okay. Right? So uh, one, you know, I hopefully have a very long career in film scoring because, you know, I feel like I'm just getting started. So if, you know, time permitted and that being the primary goal, I would potentially love to produce something uh, at first because I think the producer is really the person that pulls all of, can be the person that pulls all of the moving parts together and create basically, you know, a film or a TV show. So that might be something that would be interesting to me. Uh, and then, you know, eventually directing, don't know. I don't know about that. That's because I see what directors go through. I see, you know, uh, all of the problems and all of the challenges and all the stuff, right, that they have to be responsible for, especially on a movie like, uh, you know, Transformers Rise of the Beast. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know. Uh, hats off to Stephen Cable Jr. He navigated so many things to make this movie, and it's pretty amazing. Um, so seeing all that, I don't know. Maybe I would direct, you know, maybe a short music video or something like that. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> now, if if you're not uh, if you're not familiar with the online fan Transformers fan community, I, I just want to tell you get ready because you're you're about to you're about to be kind of a little bit more visible um, very true. I'm, I'm i'm curious to just to wondering if like if you if you if you go to like any kind of conventions there are transformers conventions and i was wondering if you if you'd entertain the thought of i would of, totally go invited. To one. absolutely if i was invited oh. i would totally show up for one of those absolutely awesome all right well mm-hmm. We we know a couple of the organizers, so we, we might right, we well, might put them in touch. <laughs> you put them in touch with me. Have the invite show up. I would love to be part of this. Awesome! awesome. And awesome. there's a big one in LA next year. Oh wow! So, okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, I I think uh, I think we we've, we've gone through all our questions, but uh, before we end the interview, we uh, we all our guests we give them a kind of a rapid fire, uh, just really 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 quick list of questions. These are not all Transformers related, just, you know, kind of either or, yes or no, A or B, trying to get, okay. get a sense of, of uh, you know, your, the, the, you know, the JB experience. So, okay, um, fair enough. <laughs> forward to this. We'll, we'll take you through these questions and uh, we'll, we'll see how you do. <laughs> okay, ready to go. Here we go. <laughs> all right. First up, uh, Autobot, Decepticon, Terracon, or Maximal? Maximal all day. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, maximal all day. So just a little thing. When we were, I was working in Paramount in the edit bay and they had transformer signs in all the offices. I chose maximal sign for my office. Nice. <laughs> just so you know. So who is your favorite maximal? Oh, that's a tough one. I want to say Cheetor. Uh, okay. 
But, you know, Optimus Primal is always great, but I would say we'd probably say Cheetor. All right. Now, Transformers live action movie, one, two, three, four, five, or Bumblebee. And I'm I'm going to exclude Rise of the Beasts. <laughs> but, so you got to pick one of the other ones. <laughs> uh, I would say one. one. One, you know, introducing us to the world. The first time, you know, you see the, the, the amazing CGI that was so ahead of its time. Uh, that really sort of like brought, still brings chills to me. I rewatched it a few times, uh, you know, during this process. And I'm like, wow, what an amazing movie. Awesome. All right, cats or dogs? Neither. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm I'm right there with you. Now I'm I'm not a pet person. <laughs> yeah, I have a kid. It's been close enough. <laughs> Jer- Jeremy's grumbling. He's got yeah. a dog. Oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, coffee or tea? Coffee. Chicken or steak? Steak. Pepsi or Coke? Ooh. Can I put Diet Coke or Coke Zero? Yeah, that's yeah, no that's fine. Okay, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> uh, Burger King or McDonald's? <sighs> that's a tough one. When I was in college, they had the two dollar Whoppers, but <laughs> 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 that got me through college. Now I would say McDonald's now, though. Okay. Uh, history or science? Ooh. These are uh, let's say history. All right. History. I'll say history. Xbox, PlayStation, or Nintendo Switch? Oh, PlayStation. All right. PC or Mac? Mac. But never mind, Mac. <laughs> 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 but I currently work on a PC, but Mac. Okay. okay. Playing both worlds. <laughs> iPhone or Android? iPhone. I don't even know what an Android is. <laughs> Is there a phone app that you can't live without? Uh, Instagram, probably. Okay. Marvel or DC? Marvel. And do you have a fa- favorite Marvel character? Well, I mean, would Black Panther be two on the nose? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Uh, yeah, I would probably have to say uh, it's between Black Panther and Captain America. All right. Uh, New Captain America. <laughs> yeah, the new <laughs> Okay, you got me. <laughs> uh, Stallone or Schwarzenegger? Schwarzenegger. Pixar or DreamWorks? Pixar. Is there a, a guilty pleasure movie that you'll always watch whenever it comes on? Like if you're flipping through cable? Uh, I probably have to say Spike Lee's School Days. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Big Brother Almighty. <laughs> <laughs> Baby uh, Giancarlo Esposito. Uh, That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, it's some classics, man, in that one, you know. Yeah. Tisha Campbell. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Star Wars or Star Trek? So I would say Star Wars for me. My wife is a hardcore Trekkie. So Star Trek for her. <laughs> Lots of fights in this household. <laughs> Simpsons, Family Guy, or Rick and Morty? Oh, Family Guy. Oh, okay. Walking Dead or Game of Thrones? <sighs> Game of Thrones. Last few seasons okay. of Walking Dead, I had to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sports, NFL, MLB, NHL, NBA, UFC, or Premier League? Ooh, I would have to say uh, NBA. Okay. Uh, cars, Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini, or Volkswagen Beetle? Ooh, I say Porsche. You know, Mirage is a Porsche. Guess, yeah, yeah. It's perfect yeah. in the new movie. <laughs> 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 and last question, blonde, brunette, or redhead? I'm going to have to say brunette. Okay. Even though redheads are sexy. <laughs> 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 All right. You did it. Congratulations. You have I, passed the test. <laughs> I passed the test. Great. Well, hopefully I'll be invited back. We'll see what happens. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anytime. You, anytime you want to come back on transmissions, you are welcome. Yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can have you back after the movie premieres. And just yeah. Talk about, you know what? That yeah. would actually be great to come back after the movie premieres and we can get a little bit more detail into the score and the process. After we actually get a chance to hear the score. Actually, get a chance yeah. to hear the score. You can ask me questions. You know, we can talk yeah. about things. So, yeah, we'd love to do that. 
Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So Transformers Rise of the Beasts, it's premiering June 9th. So just a little bit less than a month to go. So we're yeah, we we got our tickets. We're ready to go. We're we're going like we got we got the early access on June 7th. So we're 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 getting ready. So wow. Okay. All right. Great. Well, I should hear from you June 8th then. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Jean-Nic Bonton, thank you so much for joining us on Transmissions. Thanks for sitting down with us. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And we really appreciate uh, you sharing your expertise and insights with us. And you've had a really interesting career. And we're we're just so happy we got to talk to you. Well, I'm happy to be able to share. Happy to be welcomed back into the Transformers fan community. So uh, you'll be seeing more of me. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. And, uh, you know, for everyone who's watching us on YouTube, if you haven't checked out Transmissions before, we're at transmissionspodcast.com. We do two podcasts every week all about Transformers, uh, Transformers toys and Transformers media, comics, TVs, movies. So uh, we got lots of content. We also have a Transformers live play RPG podcast, Empire of Rust, that's done by some of our friends. So uh, if you are into RPGs, Dungeons and Dragons, tabletop games, Check out a Transformers themed one. So that's a uh, that's available too. So we've got all that uh, on our podcast. Our podcast available everywhere: uh, Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, and on YouTube. So check it out. Thanks everyone for watching and listening to us. Thank you again to JB for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Transmissions. If you'd like to join the conversation, travel to our Discord channel at transmissionspodcast.com slash Discord. Want some cool transmission swag? Feast your eyes on our transmissions gear at transmissionspodcast.com slash shop. If you'd like to support our podcast, go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support or tell your friends about our show. We'll see you next time.